It's an honor to be able to present to you what's happened at the Texas Heart Institute over the past year. As you know, this is something we've done for the last several years where we have a chance to reflect back on many successes that we've seen uh, over the past uh, 12 months. So just very quickly, uh, I just wanted to highlight, I don't have any personal disclosures related to this talk, but there are some institutional um, disclosures that you should be aware of, uh, including the fact that we hold equity positions and some financial interest in some of the companies that are shown in this slide. And I wanted to start here, uh, and this occurred since we got together the last time for our year-end grand rounds, and that is Dr. Angelini died. And, and he was a friend to many in this room. Uh, he was a remarkable cardiologist, but, I, but this quote came from a tribute to him that was published um, in the Texas Heart Institute Journal. And I'm just gonna read it because I think it's so poignant about Dr. Angelini and his career. And he says, Dr. Angelini with this sharp intellect indefatigable spirit and deep empathy was an exemplar as both a researcher and a human being. He inspired us to push boundaries, to look forward, and to challenge common principles to reach even higher levels of understanding and ultimately to improve the lives of patients. I'd like to just pause for 15 seconds in a moment of silence and remembrance of Dr. Angelini. Thank you. So many of you who attended last year's end of year grand rounds had a chance to look at this. And I wanted to remind you that with uh, an external branding company, we revised our vision, our mission, and our values. And I won't read all of these to you, but I wanted to just remind you that our vision to put the rest of this discussion into context is to bring the future of cardiovascular health to life. And so much of what we do is focused on translating whatever it is we're discovering in a laboratory into the clinical care of patients. And I, wouldn't, I would be remiss by not starting here. Uh, and many of you will recognize this picture. Uh, some of you might have even been in the room, uh, although I suspect you're becoming vanishingly few. Uh, but this is uh, a picture of the operating room with Dr. Cooley. Uh, at a time where a national conference was being held in Houston. And uh, the, the crowd is gathered in the operating theater to watch him perform this operation was really stunning. This picture is just still a staggering representation of the importance of the Texas Heart Institute, and particularly the surgical program in the context of American medicine. And this is a picture from this year, which is not quite as dramatic. <laughs> but I think continues to highlight the concepts that started here about education, about team-based care. And we talked a little bit about this in the Perfusion Conference this morning about the amazingly well-orchestrated operating room presence and how it takes all of those people working carefully and in close concert to get the great outcomes that we see. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking to you about some of the advances in the clinical programs, not only at the Texas Heart Institute, but I wanted to also highlight some of the changes in the hospital. So you know that in 2020, we formed an employed practice of the Texas Heart Institute for the first time. The members of that employed practice are shown here. There's a much broader practice that, that surrounds this group of professional staff members, many of them on the faculty at Baylor College of Medicine, some of our colleagues in private practice but this particular group saw really unprecedented growth in the last 12 months. In the outpatient practice, our, out, our new patient visits grew close to 60%, and our total visits grew 22%. Uh, so you can sort of see that there's this impressive amount of pent-up demand to get in to see physicians at the Texas Heart Institute. And then the clinic is, is innovating. Uh, we're transitioning to EPIC next week, uh, and that's been a, a, a long-awaited uh, but very welcome process. And we're beginning to build out subspecialty clinics in our outpatient practice, and Dr. Jorge Miranda was here. I think he still may be here, but Dr. Miranda is joining the vascular surgery program at Baylor College of Medicine, but he'll have his outpatient practice in vascular surgery in this office where we're gonna be combining surgical and medical expertise and surrounding them 
with the kinds of support services that are very unique in this kind of a clinic model. We're building out subspecialty clinics in heart failure and in atrial fibrillation and a variety of other conditions to surround a patient with the kind of expertise that they should have to live healthier uh, and um, happier lives. There's been a, a very um, dedicated focus on, uh, on quality in the practice. And there's a national program that's linked to Medicare and the payments that practices get from Medicare. Uh, and in that construct, we select quality metrics. And in the last year, you can see the quality metrics that we selected in this slide, and you can see our performance. This is a sort of a zero-sum game in the United States. You either win or you lose at this game, and we won because of this dedication and focus we have on providing the highest quality care that's available. And we also survey our patients to understand their satisfaction. How happy were you with the ease of scheduling, with your waiting times, which we still can work on a little bit? How happy were you with the staff that you interacted with? And maybe most importantly, were you happy with your physicians? And I just want to highlight for you that we've truncated the bottom end of the y-axis at 80, but you can see that the patient satisfaction in this practice is remarkably high, and we're very proud of this patient-centered approach that we take to care in the office. Our, we have three cardiac surgeons in the practice, Dr. Livesey and Dr. Cozart, who are here in the, off, in the audience today. I think Dr. Holman's not here. But you can see the surgical volumes, both for supporting the TAVR cases, but also their, their operative volumes. So very high volumes, and it's an outstanding group of surgeons that works in concert with the other surgeons who practice at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. We were fortunate to recruit Dr. Hector Medina, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Dr. Medina a little bit later, but Dr. Medina was brought in from Bogota, Colombia to reinvigorate the cardiac imaging programs, particularly in cardiac CT and cardiac MRI. And you can see what's happened to the volumes, particularly in cardiac MRI that has grown substantially with reductions in the time it's taking between the time it, an order is entered for a study and the time the report is turned out. It's improving patient care and it's drawing patients back into our organization for this high quality care that Dr. Medina and his partners are providing. And I'd be remiss without talking a little bit about the hospital and the changes that are going in the hospital and in the cardiovascular programs. And you all are very aware that Dr. Juan Carlos Plana, who's here in the front row, leads the cardiovascular service line with an unwavering North Star focus on improving the experience for our patients, on improving quality, and on improving outcomes. And these are some of the cardiac surgeons. I know you just met with Dr. Frazier, but Dr. Cozart and Dr. Livesey also shown in this uh, picture. So what does this look like? And how can we frame the, the volumes of, of cardiology and cardiac surgery in Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center? And what I've done is just taken the data that we have to date and annualized it, but we will predict that this year we'll perform somewhere around 250 TAVR procedures. The cath lab volume is approaching 8,700 cases uh, in the year. And in the, if you look at the non-invasive lab, which includes echo, both transesophageal and transthoracic echo, cardioversion, some of the other procedures done down there, probably in the 25,000 cases, and the cardiac OR is busy. We'll project that they do somewhere around 3,300 to 3,400 cases in this, in this 12 months. So it's a very busy, robust, and exciting environment for not only the physicians, but for the people who come here to train. The experience that those trainees are getting is really top notch, and they're seeing a lot of different and interesting and complex cases. I mentioned last year that if you look at the case mix index, which is a way to understand the severity of illness in a hospital, the case mix index at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center for cardiovascular disease is the third highest in the country. So this is a very, it's a high volume, high acuity hospital that's doing some very interesting and important work. You've probably kept up with the US News and World Report rankings. And this was a program that historically, when Dr. Cooley was here, oftentimes ranked in the top five uh, in the country. And as other programs began to develop and try to replicate 
the amazing work that was done here, we saw more parity in those rankings, and they dropped a little bit. You can see that in 2016, we had a relatively precipitous drop. But since that time, with this renewed focus on quality, on education, on volumes, and on patient outcomes, we've seen a progressive rise back to, I, I would argue, we're not where we want to be yet, but we're certainly making a move in the right direction under the leadership of uh, Dr. Plana and other colleagues and all of the people in this room who work hard on the clinical service uh, to keep us focused on, on outcomes. The US News and World Report rankings are complicated, and they're made up of a variety of different domains. And I just show you some of those domains in the slide to see how well this service line performs. You can see that the survival rates are ranked nationally as being excellent. Discharge to home, excellent. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but just to highlight for you that most of the things that are in the control of the physicians that, that practice medicine in this hospital are either highly ranked or ranked as excellent. We will not stop until we're back in the top five in the overall US news rankings. We still have work to do and we acknowledge that, but we have the data, which I'll show you in just a second, that will allow us to understand what our opportunities are and the leadership to improve them. On a monthly basis, we see uh, dashboards that look like this where we're taking deep dives into understanding how, what our outcomes look like, how our patients feel about their care, and focusing us on where we can be better with a concerted effort, again, to make sure that we're addressing the needs of every patient that walks in this front door. I plan to read each of these to you now. <laughs> All of that to say, what we want is for these to be completely green. And what we've learned is that as we approach yellow and green status, we change the bar and make it harder to get to. And we will not stop until we provide the most perfect care that we possibly can to the people who come here, trusting us to provide that care. The cardiac surgeons have done remarkable work in improving their outcomes over the last year. You can see this is data from the STS database. Now, we're, we have refined patient selection uh, strategies, and we have spent more time focusing on particularly the early post-operative care to lower the risk of this very sick patient population who's coming to see us. And I'm, I applaud the cardiac surgeons, the cardiac anesthesiologists, the cardiac intensivists who have worked hard this year to really move the bar in an almost unprecedented way. And I've mentioned that we look at patient experience and we can break this down by unit. So we're watching this in all of the units where our cardiovascular patients are receiving care in Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. We're laser focused on the experience that those people receive and trying to fix everything we possibly can to make it an outstanding experience. I also want to highlight for you that we have new leadership in the hospital. Uh, Brad Lemke this year was appointed as the president and CEO of Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, and Donnie McLaughlin has come as the chief operating officer a little bit more than a year ago. But this is a dynamic leadership team. They've brought in a new chief nursing officer, Seth, Seth Stevens, who's the administrative lead of the cardiovascular service line. And there's a remarkable alignment on the ways that this hospital is going to continue to improve. These are visionary leaders, they're experienced leaders, they're developing strategy for this hospital, particularly around cardiovascular, and they view cardiovascular as a key service line for Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. I appreciate the fact that they're not entirely focused on the finances through cutting resources. They have a balanced vision that we need to grow, and they're making investments in bringing new nurses into the hospital and opening beds that had previously been closed so that we can care for more patients. They're absolutely laser focused on operational excellence, and they're constantly out amongst us in the hospital trying to understand what opportunities we have as an organization to be better. And we've already talked a little bit about quality. The other thing I think that you can anticipate is a little bit of a veering away from the messaging that we've heard from Common Spirit about hello human kindness, which resonates with many people. But I think short sells 
the work that's done in this quaternary care center. And you can, you'll soon see television commercials coming out that highlight some of the programs uh, that are, uh, that are um, going on here at Baylor St. Luke's each day, and particularly around cardiovascular. We also changed the way that the cardiovascular service line is governed. It's become much more of a physician-led service line. Uh, we've developed this, and I won't go through all of this, but all of it to say that we have physicians sitting at the table with administration making important decisions about directionality, about strategy, and about investments that we need to make to make this cardiovascular program at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center and all of the physicians who, and surgeons who practice here uh, highlighted uh, and, and well supported. Uh, and if that happens, it will support the patients. So I'm going to turn now and spend some time talking a little bit more about some of the research initiatives at the Texas Heart Institute. I presented this slide last year as a way for us to frame the kinds of research themes that we have at THI with the laboratories that support that theme underneath. So we've always had um, an important focus on mechanical circulatory support and advanced heart failure. And you heard that in the last talk by Drs. Cohn and Dr. Frazier. We have a rich history of developing solutions in interventional cardiology and in electrophysiology. We were fortunate enough several years ago to bring uh, Dr. Vanderslice and Dr. Woodside into the organization who have developed a very interesting program, uh, the Molecular Cardiology Research Lab. And they've done some remarkably interesting work that's expanding out from cardiology. And they've developed a therapeutic that originally was thought to be a way to help stem cell engraftment. And they flipped that, and it's now being tested as an adjuvant cancer therapy for immunotherapy for, uh, for drug-resistant melanoma. Uh, we have some core facilities. I'm sure you're all are well aware. Of the, the most well-known in this organization is the large animal lab that we have in the basement of Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. We have an important focus on arrhythmias, which I'll tell you about in just a bit. And Dr. Coulter, who's here in the front row, has developed a really robust uh, initiative in women's health. Uh, and this program is very well funded and doing, continuing to do very good research, but also working in the community to begin identifying the challenges that many people who live in the Houston community face and difficulties they have accessing healthcare and how we can begin to break down those disparities. So this was a good year for the Texas Heart Institute in terms of funding. We had the best year from a funding perspective that we've had at least in the last decade. We garnered more than $15 million of new research awards. You can see that the 12 million of that was federal funding either from NIH or the Department of Defense. A lot of this new sponsored research is work that's being commissioned from the large animal lab uh, in the basement of the hospital. But again, a very good year in terms of funding. You already heard about the Bivacor program. This program has been in development at THI for more than a decade. Uh, we have spent the last couple of years preparing our clinical teams to do the first in human implant. And we're anticipating that that occurs later this month or in early July. And we are anticipating that that first patient that's implanted with this device that has gone through a decade of development in this hospital will be implanted in this hospital. I told you that I'd come back to electrophysiology and I wanted to highlight Mehdi Razavi and Allison Post and their team. I talked about this a little bit last year, but this continues to be such an interesting story for us. So Dr. Razavi and his team have developed an electroconductive hydrogel. That sounds like a lot of words that don't necessarily make a lot of sense, but if I could simplify this just a little bit, it's two liquids coming together to form a semi-solid that could be injected retrograde into the coronary sinus, so into the venous system of the heart and then can be used to pace. Imagine how different the experience would be for a patient to have a heart that instead of being stimulated by a single ventricular electrode, is being stimulated throughout the entire venous system of the heart. It would restore a more normal contraction pattern. And Dr. Razavi believes that this kind of approach will also have profound antiarrhythmic effects. All of this to be said that it's garnering attention 
uh, nationally <clears throat> through some very high-profile publications uh, like this one that was published in Nature Communications. Christy Ballantyne, who is the Interim Chief of Cardiology at Baylor, uh, is an outstanding and internationally recognized expert in lipid-lowering therapies. And I just wanted to highlight Christy, who's on our professional staff, for publishing four papers this year in the New England Journal of Medicine. Really remarkable work. And Christy couldn't join us today, but he sent me a note and said he was watching online. Christy, thank you for all you're doing, and congratulations on a remarkable publication success in the first half of, of uh, 2000. Uh, 24. We hope that you can double this in the second half of the calendar year. And I wanted to highlight another really interesting research program that's going on. This is Dr. Reynolds Delgado, and Reynolds is on our professional staff. He's in practice uh, here at Baylor St. Luke's, but has always been affiliated with the Texas Heart Institute. And Reynolds is, Reynolds is one of the most innovative guys that you can ever meet. He's always full of really interesting ideas, and I, I love to see his research projects because it's always something that I think, wow, that's, that's really, that, will, that could change medicine if you can make that work. Reynolds had the idea that you could place a small mechanical blood device, moving device in the descending aorta just above the renal arteries in a patient with heart failure to improve blood flow down into the kidneys. And you'll see that this product now, the aortics device, is shown at the bottom left side of the slide. And this has gone through an early feasibility study that was published in Jack Heart Failure, and the results are shown over on the right. We can see that the patients, after they got this, had remarkable changes and improvements in their hemodynamics with a robust increase in the amount of urine that they were making. So he was decongesting the patients, and he proved his hypothesis that this device actually works. This device is now going to start a pivotal trial. We're just getting ready to start enrolling in that study here in this hospital, but there's a great enthusiasm for this kind of a, approach. And Reynolds' device turns out that it will be the predicate device for, in this space. There are others who are developing similar looking devices with small nuances. But I think this is a really great tribute to the Texas Heart Institute going from a concept to first in human, just like we hope to see with Bivacor. Uh, to develop new products, again, focused on the care of patients. I wanted to highlight for you four individuals who I'm very proud of, uh, our young investigators here at THI. Uh, all of these individuals in the last 12 months have received federal funding for their work. Dr. Yashin Wang, who I saw here a little bit ago, although I can't see you now, I think you're still here, runs the Idea Lab at THI. Yashin does remarkable and interesting work in biomedical engineering. In conjunction with Dr. Frazier, Dr. Wang is working on developing small mechanical circulatory support devices that would accommodate children. And she's developing a device that would work in, ch in, in children and adults with Fontan physiology, with congenitally abnormal hearts, a group of patients that heretofore is not well served with mechanical circulatory support approaches. This is Dr. Camilla Hockman Mendez, and Dr. Mendez has the audacious goal of taking a heart out, washing the cells off, which is what you see in the middle on the bottom, with using a detergent, and then repopulating that scaffold with stem cells. Imagine if that works. Imagine being able to take a heart out that was damaged or diseased, supporting that patient with a bivacor, repopulating that heart with the patient's own stem cells so there wouldn't be rejection, and then reimplanting. Those are the kinds of ideas that we are working on at the Texas Heart Institute. And Dr. Mendez um, has received a really nice uh, early career award from NIH and other accolades for the remarkable work that she's doing. This is Dr. Shale Hussain who has branched off a little bit, maybe from what you think about cardiovascular disease. But what she's very interested in is neurodegenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's. And we understand now that Alzheimer's disease is often caused by deposition of amyloid in the brain. And so what she's doing is trying to understand how cerebrospinal fluid and interstitial fluid moves through the brain to wash that out, and the defects that people have that allow that protein to accumulate inside brains. 
This has a, the potential to really provide us remarkable and new insights into neurodegenerative diseases like, uh, like Alzheimer's disease. And then I also wanted to point out Chow Lee, who, um, who got a very nice uh, award this year. He got an R01, and Chow works with Dr. Jim Martin. They're doing some very interesting work with spatial transcriptomics. This is a sort of a challenging concept, but I'll try to explain it to you. So you can imagine that every cell and every organ is, is a tr transcribing the, mess, the information from DNA. We've gotten to the point now technologically that you can begin to understand what that transcriptome looks like. But even more importantly for Chow Li is that he can begin now to understand the DNA transcription in one cell and how it differs from a cell that's immediately adjacent and how those cells are communicating back and forth to coordinate the transcription of their genetic materials. This is a remarkable field and we have some of the world's experts in this space at the Texas Heart Institute with this advanced technology. I'd be remiss without telling you that we continue to do clinical research. Our clinical research programs are very active and I'm not gonna go through all of these only to highlight for you that not only are we doing sponsored research, but our investigators at Texas Heart are continuing to come up with new and innovative ideas that we believe will improve patient health. And we're testing those uh, in an ongoing way uh, with the people who come here uh, is, is our commitment to them to advance health. It's also important for us to continue to publish. Uh, and so we have been successful in this domain as well. And the number of publications is going up and will project it to exceed uh, that that we uh, saw last year, especially if Christy Ballantyne continues to write papers in the New England Journal of Medicine. You'll know that Dr. Cooley and Dr. Willerson who followed were committed not only to research, but also to education. And there's, over the last 62 years, there's always been a commitment to educating not only fellows, but to provide education to postgraduates. And many of you sitting in here are attending one of those events today. So I wanted to walk through some of this work. You can see that our CME calendar is busy. Our teams, some here sitting here in the front row or in the back, are in this hospital constantly taping broadcasting worldwide our educational programs. One of the most fun things that I do is after Grand Rounds, I get to sit and go talk to some of the people who've given Grand Rounds and see where people have tuned into THI Grand Rounds from across the world. I'll show you that data in a second. We have a robust Grand Rounds calendar. We sponsor conferences like this one, and we are also doing some online education. I told you that I'd tell you where people tune in from across the world to watch our Grand Rounds series. The countries are shown at the bottom. It's remarkable, people in completely different time zones across the world tune into THI Grand Rounds to get a contemporary perspective on controversial topics in cardiovascular medicine. I think this is a real tribute to the work that Dr. Coulter and Carrie Sprung do to organize our Grand Rounds series, and I thank them greatly. Carrie Sprung had a wonderful idea this year about taking some of that content that we're collecting all the time and putting it on, um, on digital platforms that can be viewed later and people can apply to get CME credit, the Texas Heart TV station, uh, which you can find uh, online, and go back and look at some of the content that we've developed over the past year. And I want, because this is actually the Perfusion Conference, I think we'd be remiss by not applauding Deb and Kathleen on the great work that they do to educate uh, the perfusion students who come here. This was a rich tradition at the Texas Heart Institute. It was Dr. Cooley's brainchild to say, this is an important group of people. They support what we do in the operating room and we can't do our work without them. It gets back to this concept of team-based care. You can see that we had in the last year, 23 graduates, all of them found jobs. Their parents were very happy. Uh, about that fact. They're finding jobs not only here, but they're going across the country. Uh, we've got people from coast to coast who are Texas Heart Institute graduates providing perfusion services in a variety of different um, organizations. And our students are scholarly. Uh, they're presenting papers. They're winning awards. They're getting scholarships. They're traveling across the world to learn 
some of the challenges that perfusionists face in other more disadvantaged parts of the world. And they've edited a chapter in a book. So I'm very, I'm very proud of this group of people and the work that they do coming here to be learners, but also recognizing that it is an obligation that we have not only to continue educating, but to continue to advance the science. Most of you know we publish a journal. We've published this journal now for 50 years. Dr. Zvanko Krasier is the editor-in-chief at this point. We've tried to continue to innovate in this space. The journal went uh, as, a, um, as an, a full open access journal earlier this year. We've refined the way that we're getting papers out. And under Dr. Krasier's leadership, the papers that are submitted to the Texas Heart Institute Journal are now turning over and being published much more rapidly. The authors are getting decisions much more rapidly than they have in the past. If you're writing, I would encourage you to submit your work to the Texas Heart Institute Journal. And our fellows who are normally sitting here in the front row, but mostly now I think are sitting in the back of the room, uh, I, I also would like to highlight them in the, for the Cardiology Fellowship. So we we're celebrating their graduation this evening, but uh, a remarkable, uh, talented, brilliant, hardworking, a team of fellows coming here uh, to learn, but also make important contributions to the care of this very sick patient population that we've talked about and to continue to advance research. And I won't highlight each of them, but I just want you to see where they're going, the kinds of postgraduate training that they're gonna achieve or, or obtain uh, and the work that they've done. And then I wanted to talk about some of the changes that we'll see. Damien, you're not changing, but I thought this was a lovely picture of you. Um, but I wanted to tell you about some of the comings and goings. We talked about Dr. Angelini uh, at the beginning. So Dr. Brianna Costello, uh, who's one of the cardiologists in the employed practice at THI, has decided to take a position in Knoxville, Tennessee to be closer to family. Dr. Costello joined the Texas Heart Institute. She was a classmate of Dr. Alex Pastalian. She's been a wonderful colleague and interventional and general cardiologist. She was in four years at THI, has already been named as a Texas super doctor, which is the top 5% of, of cardiologists in the state and a rising star. And one of the other things that Dr. Costello is less well known for, except by me maybe, is that she was identified as one of the top 100 social media influencers in cardiovascular medicine, along with people like Eric Topol and Martha Galati. So she has figured out a way to leverage social media platforms to continue to educate and challenge people on their ideas. She'll be missed. Heather Pemberton is coming. So Dr. Pemberton was a fellow here at Texas Heart and she went and uh, joined a practice in Greensboro, North Carolina and then came to her senses and decided that Texas seemed like a superior place to live. So Heather is coming back uh, and will be joining us in September. Not a, a desperately needed non-invasive cardiologist in the practice to help offload some of the work that Dr. Coulter <laughs> continues to do uh, in terms of reading all of the echoes in the practice. Uh, outstanding, uh, Heather is fantastic, uh, uh, remarkably talented cardiologist, and I think you all will enjoy interacting with her. Dr. Charles Holman is one of the three surgeons in the employed practice, and Dr. Holman has decided he's going to retire at the end of this month. His credentials are shown. Uh, he got his medical degree from Baylor. He did his internship uh, here, uh, did his cardiothoracic surgery here. And the thing that struck, I wrote to the office and I said, how many operations do you think Dr. Holman has done during his career? 15,000, which I think is just a stunning number of cases. Uh, so we'll miss Dr. Holman. I'm encouraging him to continue to remain engaged in the Texas Heart Institute. He's been a great presence, in particular in our educational conferences, and he's very willing to challenge the status quo and push us to be better doctors. I mentioned Dr. Medina already. Dr. Medina has joined us from Bogota, uh, Colombia. Um, he is very, very well trained. He got his master's of public health from Johns Hopkins, did his residency at the Cleveland Clinic, did his fellowship at Baylor and THI. And if that wasn't enough, then he went to the Mass General and did an imaging fellowship. Heck, I'm looking forward to seeing like what the next educational accolade is that you're gonna get. 
He has a particular research interest in Chagas disease and the impact of Chagas disease on the heart. He's already beginning to establish research relationships with Baylor College of Medicine, the Tropical Medicine Group, and those sorts of groups over at Baylor. And he's been a very prolific author, and we're looking forward to uh, continuing to support Hector as he develops the cardiac imaging program here. And then I wanted to mention Jim Martin, and I mentioned Jim just a minute ago. But Jim was selected this year uh, as the Tillman and Page Fertitta, Fertitta Foundation Endowed Scholar. Uh, a great tribute to Jim, who has done remarkable work in understanding the signaling mechanisms that stop cardiac myocytes from proliferating, but maybe more importantly, how to turn those signals off so that cells re-enter the cell cycle and begin dividing. And what he's been able to show in animal models is he can take a, a, an animal that's had a myocardial infarction and begin re, to repopulate that infarcted area with normal autologous cells. This, has been, this is a remarkable genetic-based therapy uh, that I think has the potential to do some, some uh, very, uh, uh, do a great deal of good for people with ischemic cardiomyopathies. And then I wanted to just highlight as I close some of the work that we've done to reestablish the Texas Heart Institute in the Houston community. And I'll tip my hat to Julie Voss, who's here in the audience, who's our Vice President for Development, who has done an incredible job. And we sort of hoodwinked Julie into joining Texas Heart and said, oh yeah, we've got the development program, everything's all great, just you step right into this great program. And she looked at it and went, that, like, I think but we needed to move from paper to a computer. Uh, and Julie has done this very hard work with a small team, but has really reestablished the connections that we have. It's important for the Texas Heart Institute to be recognized in Houston as an organization that is continuing to advance the science of, of heart disease and of cardiovascular disease and people and inspire people to use their resources to support our research programs. Last year, the philanthropy at THI approached 7.8 million. A lot of that came from a wonderful gift from uh, Frederick Weissman, who was a patient of Dr. Cooley's, who endowed uh, or, or gave the Texas Heart Institute a substantial amount of money. Uh, but others who have given uh, important amounts of money are shown in this slide. And that gift, this large gift from Dr. Weissman was picked up nationally. Uh, you know, these are the sorts of transformative gifts that catch national news attention, and it catches the attention of other givers here in the Houston and Texas market. Julie and her colleagues put together a, a, a wonderful event last year. You know, we had let the galas go uh, during COVID, and we had stopped using that as a mechanism to generate revenue to support our research programs and our education programs. And Julie and her team put together a wonderful event that raised almost $850,000 to support the Texas Heart Institute um, last year. And I'll just throw a few other uh, strategies that Julie has um, Im implemented. All I will say is that all of you are welcome to meet Julie. And if you've brought your checkbook or a credit card, she'll, there'll be a... <laughs> We'd love to have a conversation with you. If you feel that you're in a position there, you want to support the Heart Institute, we'd be very happy to have a conversation with you about what that might look like. So I'll summarize and conclude this way and just say that we continue to exert our influence through impactful clinical care research and educational initiatives. Uh, with our hospital partner with Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, we've really put together what I think are robust quality programs that distinguish us as leaders in this space. And I've always said that the days when Dr. Cooley was doing such amazing things in the operating room that no one else was doing are gone. Medicine has become much more of a commodity. And the real question today is, who does it better than anybody else? And I think that's where the Texas Heart Institute and this hospital needs to position itself. We're solving some of the most complex problems in, in cardiovascular medicine through our targeted research programs focused in those pillars of excellence that I described early, earlier. And we remain steadfast in our commitment to educating perfusion students, fellows, cardiac surgeons, and to provide the kinds of postgraduate education that attracts a viewership from around the world. I'll stop there. I'm, forever grateful that you gave me the opportunity to present this information. It, 
allows me to do something that I'm most passionate about, and that is to brag about the work that all of you do uh, at the Texas Heart Institute to make this a spectacular organization to work uh, in and a place to get clinical care and do research. Thank you very much.